Good evening and welcome to Heritage Hour. Um, we're very happy to welcome John Sadler this evening, a military and local historian who has a talk on World War I as experienced by Gateshead men and women. And um, we're looking forward to hearing this very much. So away you go, John. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Lucy. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to this Heritage Hour talk. Uh, I think a few of you will have heard me reciting Papi ad nauseam, great war verse in previous talks. But tonight I'm going to focus more on personal experience, local experience uh, in our area. And I'm sure most of you will be familiar with the Gateshead Cenotaph, which was unveiled in 1922, actually May 1922. So it's just a shade more than 99 years old. And it cost, I think if I remember rightly, £5,283 and so many pence. It was very precise in those days. Now, if you upscale that to modern values, that's a very significant sum, very significant sum indeed, probably at least a quarter of a million pounds, if not more. And those monies were raised by public subscription. I think uh, the Gateshead Cenotaph is one of the most beautiful of all of our great war memorials in this region particularly an outstanding work of art, as well as a fitting commemoration, for the sacrifice of men and women from the, from the town. There are, if I remember correctly, 374 names on the memorial of men who died in the Great War. I don't think there are any women commemorated from the Great War. Now, bearing in mind, these would be, for the, for the most part, would be young and fit men, the cream of their generation. The loss to the town would be very significant. And that's not the end of the loss. Those are men who died during the war or probably died of their wounds immediately afterwards. That toll, it takes no account, can give no account of those who died afterwards. I'll give you an example. My wife's grandfather, the local man, was, uh, he worked in the shipyards. He was badly injured while serving as a, a gunner with the Royal Horse Artillery at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. Uh, he was able to work after the war, but he suffered uh, a life-changing injury, which never properly healed. He had a, an open wound which separated it, never healed properly. And indeed, he died uh, as a result of complications from his Great War wound in 1946. That's 30 years afterward. He's not commemorated on any war memorial. He would not be considered a victim of war, but he was. And there will be hundreds, if not thousands, of men like him who came back from the Western Front, or indeed the other theatres of the war, maimed in mind and body. I will tonight also be looking at the role of women. There is a kind of assumption that the Great War was a male activity. There was men who went to fight. Well, in the main, yes, it was. But tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of women served in other ways. And I believe it's fair to say that the women's contribution overall was equally as important as that of their men folk. Women, of course, served as nurses, as voluntary nurses, as ambulance drivers. And indeed, the death toll was in the region of 2,000. 2,000 nurses and female auxiliaries were killed during, on the Western Front, many by long range random enemy shell fire. But thousands worked as munitionettes, particularly, and this was particularly strong on Tyneside, uh, which of course was a major, uh, major manufacturing center. The risks inherent in making munitions, the toxic mix of uh, nitroglycerin and gun cotton, uh, called the devil's porridge, uh, left a lot of women with permanent health problems uh, and undoubtedly shortened their lives. Others were killed outright when this highly volatile mix exploded as from time to time it did. And of course, women served on the home front. Women were doing jobs that previously men had done because the men were away. Women were forming football teams and playing football too successfully the tastes of many men because they were pretty much banned from doing so after 1918, grossly unfair. And that's because this war, this great war, unlike any other which Europe or indeed the world had experienced, was an industrial war, a war of competing technologies. There had not been such a war. Generals were fighting their battles using textbooks written in the days of Napoleon. Things had rather moved on since then, and industry dominated the war effort. 
And of course, the war had placed the two foremost industrial nations in the world, Britain and Germany, at each other's throats. The Great War would not have been possible in the form which it took, had it not been for William Lord Armstrong, of course, the great arms uh, inventor and entrepreneur on Tyneside, who, whose factories during the Great War employed nearly 70,000 people producing all manner of munitions, which of course made the uh, Tyneside a particularly attractive target for German bombers, the Zeppelins, uh, which came over from 1916. The, we tend to think of aerial bombardment as being something which occurs in the Second World War during the Blitz, indeed it is, but it began during the First World War. Now, one of the people, local people whose uh, experiences of the war and whose writings on the war, written in the, main, in the 1920s, is Charles Moss. Charles Moss was a local man. He served in, uh, I think it was 18, yes, 18 DLI. Uh, he was in action in December 1940 in Hartlepool, at Hartlepool when the Germans bombarded the town. And he's somebody who found the war a life-changing experience. He survived, but it left him with a deep and embittered cynicism. And that's something I observed, because I'm old enough to have actually spoken to many men who were, who had served in the war, my grandfather's generation, who were still alive uh, and uh, perfectly uh, competent to record when I was young, a very long time ago. And I'm going to start by reading one of his uh, later, as a letter he wrote to the press, I think, in, in uh, 1924. It was 18 DLI he served with. At every Great War Memorial service, the soldier is referred to as though patriotism had been the chief influence that had made him join the army and ultimately die in action. And to the ex-serviceman who has had his eyes open to the lies and deceptions of the Great War, how sad and ignorant it all is. He knows that practically all the pious outpourings over their dead comrades and comrades enemies are based on a false thesis. The majority of the rank and file of the contemptibles joined the army for many various reasons other than that of patriotism, unemployment, home troubles, and petty evils with the best recruiting sergeants in the pre-war days. And when the war came, a spirit of adventure was the main influence, backed by every possible means of enticement and coercion. If the psychology of the unconscripted Great War or British soldier could ever be written. Patriotism would be the least of impulses and hard instinct of men of fighting temperament at the top. The truth about the non commissioned soldier who fought in the Great War is a thing to be ashamed of, instead of being blessed and glorified as a virtue by those who are far removed from the foul realities of it. Now, that sounds like a pretty cynical viewpoint, but in fact, Moss had been through the Great War, seen a great deal of action. And that cynicism is by no means untypical of men who survived the war. How different is that from the great upsurge of patriotism, the huge enthusiasm for the war, which sent uh, crowds of hundreds and thousands out into the street to cheer on the flag and cheer the boys departing from the Western Front. Of course, remember, this was the war that would be over by Christmas. Well, every said which Christmas. And a popular ditty of the time, railed against conscription. The idea was all the continental armies, the Germans, the French, the Italians, the Russians, all had conscription. So young men were obligated to go and fight. There's no choice in the matter. Britain has never had never had conscription at that point. The service in the armed forces had also had always been voluntary. You volunteered to serve the essence of the British fighting spirit. And there was great resistance in 1940 to any idea that there should be conscription. Of course, it did come in later in 1916. This is no conscription. Will you show your love of freedom? Will you stand for truth and right? Will you take the path of wisdom and be ready for the fight? For we won't have conscription. We all hate conscription. We don't want conscription, so we'll all be volunteers. Will you keep your homes in safety and protect the fatherland? Have your commerce prosper greatly on the sea and on the land? Have we foes across the water who must be kept at bay? If we value freedom's charter, we'll be ready in the name. But should the foe ever threaten or touch our silver strand, we will drown him in the ocean by the aid of God's right hand. 
there's this tremendous belief that Britain, uh, British Empire, were the guys in the white hats rushing to assist gallant little Belgium, which had been, it has to be said, most brutally and savagely overrun by the Kaiser's legions. And this was the guiding principle, I think, um, in the spirit of 1914, that the war was just, this was a just war. Britain was obliged by treaty to defend Belgian neutrality, so there was every proper legal pretext under international law for getting involved. What nobody understood, of course, was the scale that that involvement would take and how great the casualty lists would be. In 1914, Britain sent out an expeditionary force of 100,000 men. By the end of the war, across the globe, there were nearly 6 million men under arms, an enormous number greatest military force the world has ever seen, certainly the largest in Britain ever put in the field, and actually we've been paying for it ever since. As ever among Geordies, there were the wags, those who had something funny to say. And there's one poem I came across in the archives, and of course, Gates and Archives are a wonderful source of information on these subjects, something which I heartily recommend to anybody who is interested in the period, and of course, in their own family history. Uh, I don't know who wrote this, it's anonymous, as so many of these are, uh, it has to be said with a fake German accent, so my apologies to the European Union in advance. And it's called, I will send out ultimatums. Is there anyone I forgot? Kaiser Wilhelm said to his chancellor one day. I have got a new game that I am going to play. I am the best ruler in the world today. I will send out ultimatums. Of course, I will be ruler of every land. Almighty God is my second in command. When I go to heaven, he will sit on my right hand. Well, I will send him an ultimatum. The local regiments, primarily in some of the, some of the Fusiliers and the Dermot Infantry, contributed way above their weight, as it were, in terms of the men they sent out to war. The Dermot Infantry, for instance, had 38 battalions. Now, battalion uh, full strength was a thousand men. So that effectively is a 38, 40,000 young men from this area. Many of them, of course, came from Gateshead. The allowed recruited very heavily in Gateshead. And at least some Gateshead men also served with the Northumberland Fusiliers. Uh, one of these uh, was a young man called Herbert Woff. Now, he was, um, he volunteered for the Tyneside Commercial System, six at the time. And in fact, he was badly wounded in the second battle of Ypres, Saint Julien, in 1915. And he, again, is one of those who's left us a very interesting and a full record of his time at the front. This is his post war reflection or part of it. Do you remember you at the street corner or you in your private office? The thaw near Peron, which turned dry trenches into miniature canals. The march up to Ara in the snow, when someone burst a blood vessel and died by the roadside. The promulgation of a court martial before daybreak near a Belgian farmhouse, followed by a volley in the next field, and within two hours, a newly filled grave in the field beyond. Do you remember that particular smell, which had only one meaning the miles of duckboard track with horrid caricatures floating in the slime beneath? Do you remember the March Retreat in 1917, when the unit strolled 30 miles across country in seven days, half asleep, defending a road here and a wood there? Do you remember when, on one parade, the battalion numbered two officers and less than 20 men, when the French shot some of us quite by accident, and our own gunners, again by accident, shot others? Very different tone to the message sent out by uh, Lord Kitchener, who was, of course, both Minister of Defence and Commander of the Armed Forces. His message was, of course, uh, extremely patriotic and extremely um, evocative in tone. And, of course, so many young men, a million young men from across the UK, volunteered in that rush of enthusiasm in 1914. You are ordered abroad as a soldier of the king to help our French comrades against the invasion of a common enemy. You have to perform a task which will need your courage, your energy, your patience. Remember that the honour of the British Army depends on your individual conduct. Be invariably courteous 
considerate and kind. Never do anything likely to injure or destroy property and always look upon looting as a disgraceful act. Do your duty bravely, fear God and honor the king. Uh, well, that's all very stirring stuff. And yet the young men who did volunteer and did indeed hang their, following their training serve in France, many of whom of course had belonged to the pre-war uh, territorial units. Normally territorial units were not obliged to serve abroad, uh, but almost all of them volunteered. In fact, one of the probably possibly the earliest regiment to serve aboard were the Northumberland Hussars, a cavalry regiment. And cavalry sounds a bit of an anachronism in the Great War, and very soon would be. They spent most of the war fighting on foot. But the Hussars, uh, who were effectively a 19th century yeomanry creation, went to war in 1914. Uh, one of the nice stories about the Hussars um, is about a Gateshead individual, but not a person, a cat, Peter the Cat. Now, Peter the Cat was thrust into the arms of Sergeant Armstrong by his girlfriend as the um, Hussars were in training in Newcastle, uh, after getting on the train in Newcastle. And she said to him, look, um, take the P cat, Peter, kitten, he'll be a mascot for you. And now, she's quite a clever young woman, this office, because the cat, in fact, was extremely grumpy. And I suspect that she and her uh, fellow women, she was in service in one of the big houses, just wanted to get rid of him. Anyway, Peter the Cat went to war. I'm not sure he was too keen on it, but he went to war. And he served all the way through the war. He survived the entire war and did indeed become a mascot for the Hussars, for the cavalry, as they fought as infantry in dreadful trenches in awful conditions throughout four years of terrible warfare. He survived every single battle. His favorite place was on top of the ration cart, uh, largely well, for two reasons. One, it was warmer. And secondly, of course, he was near to the food, which is a subject always dear to his heart. He didn't care much for the Germans, but he really earned his keep by killing rats. Uh, of course, the trenches were full of rats, and Peter, having a particularly aggressive temperament, was the ideal rat catcher. In fact, uh, it was always said that rats very quickly learned to avoid any trenches, uh, which were being manned by the Northumberland Hussars. He survived the war. As far as I'm aware, Peter was the only uh, cat to actually get a medal. He was actually given a medal, as a wonderful photograph of him, uh, actually receiving the medal. He was still pretty grumpy. They actually had to tie him down. Uh, so he put the medal around his neck before he could like, rip uh, ripped the face off the whoever was trying to pin it. So Peter uh, survived and went into honourable retirement and uh, lived for many years a uh, much more quiet life than he had in the trenches, of course. Now, the reality of trench war very quickly began to bite home. And everybody found that the experience uh, was not at all what they had hoped for, not at all what they had been promised, indeed not at all what they had expected. And although the generals in the First World War um, get a fair bit of stick for this, the fact was this was new, this was industrial warfare, nobody really had any idea as exactly how it was going to play out. The War of Maneuver lasted uh, throughout the summer and autumn months of 1914, but then it very quickly bowled down during the late autumn and winter after the first Battle of Ypres into a stalemate. And that stalemate continued on and off pretty much continuously for the next four years. Now, I was mentioning the Northumberland Hussars, and they were, as I've said, one of the first regiments to actually serve abroad. And most of these young men, of course, little now, had never been abroad, didn't have holidays abroad at that time. And as Charles Moss has said, it was the spirit of adventure. It was this idea of adventure that attracted them to serving in the armed forces. So the Hussars on the 5th of October 1914 sailed into Zeebrugge on the, an old steamer, the Minneapolis from Southampton. The morrow broke cold and wet as we steamed slowly into harbour. It was late in the afternoon before we set off down a long, typical Belgian road toward Bruges. Our reception was ecstatic. At every hamlet along that poplar line stretch of Pave, the inhabitants would raise a cheer for Les Anglais. Our little urchins would clamour for buttons and badges. Pretty girls would almost drag us from our saddles to kiss us and shake our hands. And it sounds like a pretty jolly war, really, doesn't it? Um, they soon realised that war uh, was a good deal less agreeable than that a joyous welcome might seem. I was picturing myself 
Saturday night at home, and thinking how little the boys there were dreaming of what we were doing that night. And suddenly, a succession of reports sounded in the air. I must confess, I could not determine whether they were rifle shots or not. But just then, a shadow loomed up before me, and with an effort, I spluttered out, Halt! Who goes there? I had my finger on the trigger, and I was running for him. I felt, again, I must confess, much relieved when immediately there came the whispered assurance, Red. It was an infantryman, like myself, on outpost duty, and he inquired if I'd heard anything lately. Yes, I replied. I think it must be the rumbling of transport uh, wagons on the cobbled route, or cobbled road. No, mate, was his rejoinder. It was 15 rounds rapid. The battle was drawing nearer. The cavalry very quickly found uh, that riding horses into battle uh, was going to be a thing of the past, and that most of the horses eventually would end up pulling ration carts and transport wagons rather than being used for any great and glorious charge. And they found the marching very hard indeed, though they trained and though they were fit young men, the demands of war, the physical rigor uh, which um, service demanded, it was pretty taxing. To a cavalryman, even a veteran, it is worse. Not only does he have to do his share of the marching, there's his horse to be cared for, to be fed and watered before he can attend to his own wants. And then we were not veterans. The outbreak of war had found us civilians, many in sedentary employments, and two months of strenuous training, even when accompanied by the best will in the world, can only do something toward case hardening. The other thing that struck the soldiers was the heartrending scenes of refugees, something the British had never experienced. Our island status had meant that Britain had never been exposed to all out assault, to being overrun by foreign armies in the way that Belgium and Northern France were now experiencing. And the Northern men found the sight of refugees on the road, both unsettling and uh, deeply troubling. I remember how a family consisting of an old man, presumably a grandfather, and a young mother, uh, with a child in her arms and two other children clinging to her skirt, were leaving their little cottage by the roadside. Their barrow, drawn by a dog, stood loaded with bedding and culinary utensils, the group presenting a most pitiable sight. The most pathetic moment came, however, when the old man sorrowfully closed the shutters, locked the door, and signed to the woman to move on. It was too much for her. Her feelings found vent in a flood of tears, which the poor kiddies and the old man joined in. The few minutes before they composed themselves sufficiently to start off on their journey toward France and hopefully safety. This is a very different image of war to that which all the glorious, um, all the glorious pre-war posturing, all the glorious speeches at the time of the war or well, the recruiting posters had actually uh, revealed. And for these young men coming from this region, clearly these sights and the many horrible sights which they began to see, the smells, the sounds, everything, all the horror of war, because um, the First Battle of Ypres was a very close run thing. The British very, came very close to being overwhelmed and suffered 58,000 casualties. This was unheard of. Um, at big battles like Waterloo, the British actually suffered five or six thousand casualties. That was a huge battle, it went on all day. But the fight for battle for a month and suffer 58,000 casualties it was absolutely astonishing. This was something which nobody had really experienced before. And uh, there was worse to come, it has to be said. The big push began on the 1st of July, 1916. This was the Battle of the Somme. Now, of course, that is synonymous in British minds with the level of loss. On the 1st of July, 100,000 British troops, British and, British and um, Commonwealth Imperial troops, went over the top. Of those, 57,000 became casualties. Of that 57,000, 19,000 were fatalities. The worst and bloodiest day in the whole of British history. The Northern regiments 
suffered particularly heavily. The Tyneside Irish and the Tyneside Scottish, which were both uh, brigades within the Northumberland Fusiliers Regiment, suffered particularly terribly. The Tyneside Scottish went into battle uh, 3,000 strong and were cut to pieces long before they actually reached the German line, before they even reached our own front line. And uh, Private Woodhouse, a little man who was present at the battle, left a particularly poignant uh, poem which he wrote about the Tyneside Scottish at the Battle of the Somme. Now listen to my story, I won't keep you long. It's about the Tyneside Scottish in the Battle of the Somme. It was on July the 1st when the Scottish made to attack. The shells began to burst, but that didn't hold them back. Oh, it was a terrible day. They fought with all their might. They were fellows, they were falling, both on the left and on the right. And when all was over, I'm sorry to relate, all that we could number was 128. Now my friends remember what the local lads have done. They fought and died for their country's sake, the Battle of the Somme. Now, if we think about that, there were 3,000 men in that brigade. And by half past nine in the morning, they could muster 128. That's a level of loss and sacrifice that we can barely begin to comprehend. It's um, worse than the total loss of life in the Twin Towers, for instance, in 9-11. And that was on the first day of the battle. Battle of the Somme lasted for four months, all the way through July, August, September, October, and into November. And the total loss of life on the British side, dead and wounded, um, seriously wounded, was 420,000. 420,000. Fittingly, perhaps, the last large set piece attack during the course of the battle on the 5th of November 1916 it was carried out by one, five, one brigade, it's a Durham Light Infantry Brigade. Uh, the 6th, 8th and 9th Battalions, DLI, led by Brigadier Roland Bradford, Brigadier, man commanding a brigade. Um, it tells you something about the level of loss in the course of the war. The Bradford, uh, who was a VC winner, was a Brigadier at 24. He was leading a brigade at 24. The attack uh, was against a German position at the southern end of the Somme front called the Butte de Valencourt. Anybody who had the chance to go to the DLI Museum, of course, in Durham, uh, will have seen, while well, I was home, will have seen the wooden crosses, which were later laterally erected on the Butte. The Butte was a man made feature. It was like Silver Hill, it was a giant Iron Age tomb, this burial man, held by the Germans, honeycombed with passages to chalk soil, of course. The Germans had turned the mound literally into one huge bunker, studded with machine guns. And of course, they had a complete view of the Allied trenches, and there was a whole apron of support trenches thrown out in front of the butte itself to guard the approaches, uh, studded with uh, barbed wire, of course. The weather was foul. This was November on the Somme. Anybody has been to the Somme in November will notice how bad it can get and how quickly this chalky soil turns into a thick, glutinous mud like super glue. Unless you've experienced it, you've really got no idea how bad it is. So bad was the mud that the preliminary bombardment, which was scheduled, couldn't take place. The guns could not be kept steady in the mud. Bradford uh, actually appealed to Ronson, uh, his um, the command, army group commander, and um, indirectly to him, to Hague, to pull call off the attack. He thought there was no point in the attack, but the attack was foolish, was suicidal, even they took the butte. Uh, behind it was overlooked by uh, second general line. There was no point in it. Never mind any hope of taking it. Nonetheless, the orders came through. The attack must be carried out. Um, First World War generals were obsessed with taking and holding ground. So the local lads in the half dark of that November morning stumbled out of their trenches up to their knees in mud, carrying their weapons, their light machine guns, their trenching tools, 60 odd pounds, what's that, 30 odd kilos with a kit, stumbling through this mud without artillery support. Germans knew they were coming, of course, and they were ready. In spite of this, in spite of the huge toll of German machine guns extracted from the local lads, they battled into the German trenches. They took the trenches. They clawed their way up that chalk nightmare and took most of the butte. Except, of course, the top, again, was studded with German machine guns, and some of these proved impossible. Once the Germans were established within the defensive, the former German defensive ring, the Germans did what they always did. They laid down a curtain of fire 
artillery in no man's land, making it impassable. That meant that resupply, reinforcement, simply could not get up. The Durhams were on their own, running out of ammunition, many men dead and wounded, and no hope of resupply. They hung on all that afternoon, hung on to their gains, which they'd paid for in blood, till eventually, in the dusk, Bradford called the attack off and extracted what was left of his brigade. He was dead right. The attack had been a total failure and nothing whatsoever had been gained. The Germans uh, were still in possession and were strong as they had ever been. It's not surprising that this uh, produces a rather cynical response from many soldiers. Now, I mentioned Charles Moss before. Moss went through the Battle of the Somme and uh, wrote a poem, Christmas Day 1916, called Kitchener's Army Soldiers, Christmas Day in the Workhouse. It's Christmas Day in the Workhouse. The paupers are called up in their groups. The only men left here to grouse are the broken or lead swinging troops. You ask, sir, why that you ask me why the troops grouse, sir? When they're still when they've still got three limbs and an eye. It's not that they're broken in body, sir. They're broken in pocket, that's why. Don't think they're fed up with the workhouse, because they've fed the best of them all, far better than most of the mobbies who've not answered their country's call. Of all the war billets they've had, sir, like shell fired farms out in France. To sleep on a clean wooden floor, sir, this Christmas, they're glad of the chance. You ask if there's any complaints, sir. It's not just the rations you mean. A soldier should never complain, sir. But I'll tell you what I have seen. Our sergeant's a sarcastic time server, and his soldiering on the barrack square. And a bit on that big fatigue, sir, they call the South African War. He's never been up the line, sir. Never been over the lid, and nor seen the square headed swine, sir, behind the bombing post hid. He don't understand Kitchener's mob, sir. Thinks soldiering is just dressing up, saluting and drawing your bob, sir, and getting plenty of beer to sup. He sang, Oh, what a lovely war, sir, while we stood to in the trenches. He went square pushing all trim, sir. Then in the sex war with wenches. These BS. F boys in the workhouse don't need spit and polish parades. They're more used to going at night, sir, on patrols and no bombing raids. Tommy never loses his sense of humor, even in the uh, most desperate circumstances. Emos, uh, who turned into quite a poet, like so many locals did in the trenches, also wrote uh, his own version of Private Tommy Atkins. This is not the Kipling version, this is the, the homegrown version of Private Tommy Atkins. A one army forms Tommy, the name he bears, but in the ranks, this moniker's no good. If he's a Murphy, wherever he cares, he'll get no other name than Spud. And if he's one of the family clerk, who was baptized Fred or Jack or Bobby, or uses his number to keep it dark, he'll always loudly be called Nobby. And if his two surnames should be Miller, let him be a fraud or good and trusty, a man or a mouse or a lady killer, you'll find he will always be called Dusty. Soldiers may ever be ready to die when they get their baptism fire and be forgotten wherever they lie, but their nicknames must never expire. So, the war was very different to what most local men had expected. And for some, like Lance Sergeant Cross, uh, the Gateshead man. It proved to be something far worse than he could ever have imagined. One of the most contentious issues of the Great War is that of the shot at dawns, young men who were shot for a variety of offences by their own side. In the course of the war, court martials handed down something in the order of three and a half thousand death sentences. Now, none of these could be carried out until Field Marshal Haig himself, who was then commander in chief, uh, had given the, or had stamped every single case. And in fact, he commuted 90% of the sentences. So 90% of those who were sentenced to be shot were reprieved and their sentences were reduced by their hard labor. 358 men, as far as we know, were shot. 
it is possible there's an all a number, quite a significant number, of should we say unofficial court marshals, and men were clearly shot by their own men or their own comrades, ex comrades behind the lines that never reached any kind of headline. Across was um, a lance sergeant. He was a bantam, a bit man, he was a bit man by trade. A bantam, that means he was under five foot three. And uh, he had an exemplary war record in 1915, except one night he was manning a forward observation post with his officer. Now, he shouldn't have been on duty. He had a high temperature. Uh, he uh, was suffering from, probably from a form of pneumonia, and was clearly in a bad way. However, as he would have the German raiding party attacked. His officer was badly wounded, and according to his uh, testimony, told him to get back and find help. In fact, he was found some time later in the rear of the uh, frontline trenches without his rifle. He was accused of cowardice in the face of the enemy and also of having thrown away his weapon. His defense was that he had been ordered to move back by his officer and was attempting to find assistance. The Germans had been pursuing him and had jammed his rifle across the trench. And this, was a, this was an accepted tactic to slow them down. And he had not left the battle area. Uh, it was clear from medical report that he was uh, in poor health and should not have been on duty. Unfortunately, the only man who could corroborate his statement, his defense, would have been his officer who had died of his wounds without being able to uh, report. Now, the way court martials worked was that the man would be tried at unit level, that's battalion level. The sentence would be reviewed at divisional level and then at corps level at army level, and finally uh, by the commander-in-chief. And nobody could be executed until Hague had stamped the papers, as it were. Uh, and that was Cross's defense. Now, he was actually defended by a fellow soldier who was in Civvy Street, a solicitor. So this was a martial law, but it wasn't an unfair trial. However, the burden of proof in a court martial is exactly the same as that for normal criminal matters. In short, the defendant must be proved guilty of the offence beyond all reasonable doubt. Whether there's doubt, as in a civil trial, he must of course be acquitted. Now, I would have said, and I've reviewed this case, I've reviewed quite a number of cases that I used to be a lawyer, I would have said that in his case there was significant doubt. Did he suffer loss of nerve? Did he black out? We don't know. But the first he was assisting a bit mitigation given his medical state, and also his account stacks up. And whilst there was nobody who could corroborate his statement, there was nobody who could categorically say uh, that it was untrue. So being doubt, he should have had the benefit of the doubt. He didn't get it. He was sentenced uh, to death by firing squad and was indeed shot. Remember, he was a volunteer. Not quite what he volunteered for. But it wasn't just uh, men, of course, as I said, who served in the war. A number of many local women served uh, in a nursing capacity. And one of these was a, a lady called Pat Beecham. Well, actually lost a leg in the war, and served, but served again in the Second World War. Uh, she was a nurse by profession and served throughout the war, even though she actually lost a leg in Italian, but in her nursing capacity. And kept it happily for all of us, kept a, a fairly significant record of this. 13th of October, 1914. In between the actual dealing with the wounded, which is only too real, it all feels like a play or a dream. Why should the whole of France, at any rate along the railways and places on them, be upside down, swarming with British soldiers and all, French and English, working for and talking of the one thing? Everything and every house and every hotel, school and college being used as something different from what it was meant for. Everything is universal. You hear a funny alienation of educated and uneducated English from all sides of you, and loud French gabbling of all sorts. By day, you see aeroplanes and troop trains and artillery trains, and by night, you see searchlights and hear the incessant wailing and squawking of the train whistles. On every platform and at every public doors or gates are the red and blue French soldiers with their long, spiky veins, the Rosalies, or our Tommies with the shorter, broad veins that don't look half as deadly, though I expect they are actually much worse. Now, 
being a nurse, as I mentioned, was by no means a cushy billet. Uh, nurses, in many cases, were experienced, exposed to the papage was one of them, to the full effects of German artillery, 15th of October, 1914. We are having quite an exciting afternoon. Shells are coming in at intervals into the village. I've seen two burst in the houses, and one came right over our train. The two French soldiers on the line lay flat on their faces. Uh, one or two old ladies got under the train. One went on fishing in the pond close by, and the wounded Tommies got rather excited and translated the different sounds of them, Jack Johnson, and them coal boxes and Calamity Kate, and all of our guns and the machine gun popping. There's a troop train just behind us that they may be potting at, or some gunners uh, in the village or in the Royal Engineers camp. There have been two aeroplanes over us this afternoon. You hear the shell coming a long way off, well, like a falsetto motor engine, and then it bursts twice in the trees of this wood where we are standing. There's an endless line of French horse transport winding up the wood on the other side, and now some French cavalry. The RTO is now having the train move to a safer place. It's where we travel to us. The troops have all gone except the first division, are waiting for the French to take their place. And then all the British will be in the Ara line, I believe, where we shall go next. There's another close to the train. They make such a fascinating purring noise coming, ending in a singing scream. You have to jump up and see. It's a yellowish green sound. You can't see it till it bursts. And we should remember as well that the war wasn't just about men and women. Animals took part in the war, apart from Peter the Cat. The half a million horses uh, were involved, taking horses which are in many ways conscripted. Of course, I don't want to be particularly sorry for the horses in the war because clearly um, they didn't have a choice. They were conscripted. And they had no idea, presumably, why they were there. One man, a local man who served um, extensively with horses during the war, was Sergeant George Thompson. He was born in 1893. He'd actually worked in Hawkes uh, Breweries for a while. So he was used to handling horses. Uh, he'd been a territorial, well, he was a territorial. And um, he served in the 1st, 7th uh, DLI in horse transport. So he, because he was used to working with horses, he was assigned to the horse transport. So he starts off his account. It was written in the 1920s as account for his daughter. A battalion got horses, the wagons, wagons belonging to a local contractor. Then we started to train for war service. I was stationed in the drill hall for a while whilst the government was buying the horses. I can still remember the old driver saying, take care of him, he's quiet and a good worker, will go anywhere. Little did anybody think what was in store for them. Say about myself. The horse I was in charge of was a right bad one. Nearly every time I took him for a drink, I used to get into trouble. I used to kick, bite and bolt. Now, we were fitted out with proper army service gear. Each man had to manage two horses. We went over to Newcastle to collect a pair and a limber wagon for each driver. I was to be the number one driver. There were around 60 horses in mules on our strength and perhaps 50 men. All drivers were taken to 50th Durham R R RFA, Royal Field Artillery, and went through a hard week's training to learn both how to ride and to drive. They gave us some stick, I can tell you. First came riding bareback and then with saddles on. We were sore for days afterwards. Now, officers, gentlemen, took their horses to war. And one of them was Lord Joycey from uh, West of Hexham. And he took his horse called Coco. Coco was a, now these were fine horses. These were not draft horses. These were hunters. The horses generally used them for hunting before the war. Uh, but of course, they very quickly found that war, there was no scope for cavalry action. Uh, in the Great War in trenches. And so most of their horses end up being taken for transport. That's a bit of a come down for Coco, of course. He'd been a piece of pretty pampered horse, thoroughbred, a very fine, very strong animal. Of course, he was particularly valued by the commissariat because of his strength. And he spent the rest of the war dragging wagons, uh, being driven by somebody like George Thompson. This was very dangerous. This was not a cushy billet by any means. Obviously, the wagons, the horse drawn wagons, brought up supply to the frontline trenches at night. Could come up the day, of course, they'd be exposed. But the German artillery had their sights pretty much zeroed in on the roads that they would take, a very limited number of approaches. And all the way through the hours of darkness, they would keep these roads under constant shell fire. And therefore, the casualties amongst horses and drivers were particularly high. George Thompson actually won a military medal for his gallantry. Coco, 
had medals been given out to horses, would have got one too. And he survived the war. But at the end of the war, the horses were not returned to their owners. They were simply sold off. The army sold them off. Uh, the weaker ones, of course, would go for horse meat. French farmers were allowed to buy horses only to replace the horses, draft horses, which they had lost uh, to the Germans or indeed to their French army during the war. Uh, Coco survived, but was a bit unlucky in his purchase. His buyer was a rag and bone man. A rag and bone man who would go around the streets, he said, castle. Uh, you know, any old iron, any old iron. Famous crime. Now, this particular rag and bone man was a pretty brutal employer. And the poor horse was dragging, uh, well over a ton in weight, up and down the hills. But he survived. This was in 1920. And then one day, as on a hot summer's day, he pulled this dreadful load up the bank. A young woman stopped and looked at the horse. I said to the man, probably very well accented English, I say, my man, where did you get the horse from? He said, well, I bought him like. I said, well, I know that horse. He's my brother's horse, called Coco. I want him back. To which she replied, wait, you know what you can do, you put, you know? So uh, she was a feisty young lady and wasn't prepared to take no for an answer. This was Coco. This was the family horse, and she wasn't even without him. Offered to buy him. The man said, no, I'm going to sell him. Um, and then, of course, as happened in those days, along came a policeman. Not in a panda car, on his foot. Probably said, hello, 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 what's going on here? So she said, well, look, this is my family horse. I know it's my family horse. I know instinctively. I grew up with this horse. I knew the animal. The looks said, had a way pet. Ha! Huh. Hey, just daft or what? So the policeman said, well, it's going to be a bit tricky, miss. I don't know how you can possibly prove this is your horse. She says, I'll tell you what. Just take him out of the halter. Take the horse out of the halter. She walked down the street and yelled, Coco. Of course, the horse came galloping to her straight away. So striking sparks off the cobbles. He said, hello, hello. Seems to be an answer. So he obliged the rag and bone man to sell the horse to her, I think for something like five pounds, which is a reasonable price at the time. And Coco went safe home. Apparently, when he was finally got home, he went straight into his favourite store and didn't stop eating for three or four weeks. So um, nice to end on a, on a good news story after something which was um, one of the most traumatic experiences which people in the north of England have ever undergone in some ways. That we didn't have the blitz to that extent, more traumatic even, I think, than the Second World War. And the men and women who returned from the war were promised two things by David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister. Firstly, a land fit for heroes, which Owens was in. And also that that war, the Great War, had been the war to end all wars. Well, the Prime Minister, as Prime Ministers are perhaps wont to be, was wrong or disingenuous on both counts. Obviously, the society and the economic conditions to which these men returned, these veterans returned, were anything but uh, treatment fit for heroes. So there was unemployment, there was depression, there was despair, there was sickness. There was a malaise throughout the 1920s and 1930s. And the North suffered far worse than the South. Of course, you have the famous Jarrah hunger marches as a consequence of that. And of course, it wasn't the war to end all wars. The First World War began a whole series of wars. And some would say, it's a different, it's, it's another subject, but some would say that the Second World War was a direct consequence of the First World War. The harshness of the terms imposed on Germany under Versailles fueled the rise of fascism in Germany after 1933, well, before 1933, but rampantly so once Hitler was returned to power in 1933. And that inevitably led to the Second World War. And perhaps it was also the memory of the First World War that led many British politicians, many people in Britain, to favour a policy of appeasement, effectively allowing the Germans to claw back what they thought might be theirs, rather than risk an armed confrontation. The appeasers, um, they were Chamberlain, Lord Halifax, got a very bad reputation during and after the war. And whilst they were naive, perhaps one can't altogether blame them. Men like Halifax, who had been through the trenches for four years in hellish warfare, seen the loss and suffering and devastation, were prepared, and I think we have to understand this, to go to almost any lengths to avoid their sons and daughters having to go through the same thing. I think that is entirely understandable. Um, but we're running out of time, so thank you very much, everyone, and I'll do my best to answer any questions that you may have, uh, easy ones, obviously. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. That was so interesting to hear all of those different perspectives and I'm sure everybody enjoyed the story about Coco. That was really, 
really, really um, delightful story there. So um, if anybody would like um, to put any questions to John, do please write them in the comments box below this video um, and I'll uh, pick them up and, and we'll have a, a discussion about any of your points. And um, as John mentioned previously, um, when we were talking, if any of you have any experiences um, that you've heard about from family members that you'd like to share with us, then we'd be really interested um, if you'd like to write a brief comment about those. Um, obviously, you know, people have had so many different kinds of experience during the First World War. And, um, you know, the talk that John has gone through has, has addressed a number of different aspects. Um, but if you've got any other things that you'd like to bring up, do please write a comment for us. Um, mm. Just to start off with, John, I did, um, I was interested to hear you talking about how um, shocking the refugee situation would have been for people who had gone abroad for the first time and yep. seeing people, um, you know, having to leave their, their towns and villages and homes. Um, I know that we did house a number of Belgian refugees at Elizabethville mm -hmm. in Bertley. Um, yep. And, you know, that, that um, we'll have, we'll have, there's quite a, a number of resources about that in Gateshead Archive. But I wondered if such camps were unusual in England or was that quite, were there, were there, were there a number of them? Uh, there were a number of them. Obviously, Elizabethville uh, was an important one because the, the budget refugees were themselves skilled workers, of course, and they were working in the oil ordnance factory in Gateshead. So these people, uh, having been driven out of their homes, uh, driven into exile effectively by the German advance, uh, were fighting back to an extent, in that they were contributing their labor towards the war effort. And I think today, when we see terrible footage of refugees forced to flee because of conflict in Syria or the Middle East or anywhere, we must bear in mind that is what the, our local, uh, local men were seeing, but not in Syria, not in, at any distance. They were seeing it firsthand in France and Belgium. They were seeing hundreds <laughs> and thousands of people literally forced onto the roads, uh, and many of whom simply just gave up and died by the roadside, many were killed by German shelling. So uh, it was a particularly horrible part of the experience, which nothing and nobody had obviously prepared them for. Thank you for that. Um, and then you're talking about the, um, the sort of the court martial experience mm -hmm. there and how, how different, how much of a far cry that would have been from the large number of men to volunteer, as you mentioned in 1914. And I just wondered if you'd like to talk a little bit more about what drove such a large number of men to volunteer. The, one of the features of the Great War, which was perhaps unique and one of the first times in history, was the use of mass propaganda, the manipulation of the media and the use of propaganda. There were many stories in the early in 1914, after August, of German atrocities in Belgium. Now, these were genuine. There, there were significant numbers of German atrocities. The Germans cannot escape that responsibility. Terrible, brutal atrocities. And yet, the press reports did blow these up to an even greater level than they actually were. So public indignation was roused by the media. And of course, that famous recruiting uh, poster of Kitchener's, where he points his stern finger, a bit mm -hmm. like Stephen Fry, actually, black guy at you and says, your country needs you. Doesn't matter where you go, how you duck or die, that finger and his eyes are still uh, pointing straight at you. So it's very effective propaganda. And of course, the other thing was that Britain had not been, <clears throat> had not fought a major war, I say a European war, mm -hmm. since 1854, since the Crimea. There had been colonial wars, there had been the South African war, mm -hmm. but the, first, the real war that Britain had been involved with was the Crimea, which was a much, much, much smaller war than the Great War. So it was this manipulation of propaganda and this belief that we, the British, were the guys in the white hats uh, that we had. Oh, indeed, we did have a moral and legal obligation to Belgium. The Germans had flaunted Belgian neutrality and had dealt terribly with the people in Belgium. So uh, there was this feeling of moral outrage. This was a just crusade. This was a crusade, really. Mm -hmm. um, and that we were all doing, and the right thing to do was to join up and fight for your country. In the hope, of course, it would all be over by Christmas. And um, with regards to the propaganda, is that something that sort of as time went on, people started to see through a little bit more? And did, do you think that that might have inspired some of the, the more cynical poetry and, and some of the readings, obviously, that you've did express quite a cynical viewpoint? Is that people having kind of 
understood that the propaganda wasn't always um, strictly, you know, it was propaganda. Yes. Um, and again, we have to, and I don't mean this in a, a critical sense. The people in 1940 were naive. They had no experience to fall back on. This was the first time this had happened. And this bombardment by propaganda was, was again, completely new. So people were taking it. And to be fair, the generals and politicians also thought it would be over, be over by Christmas. Mm -hmm. Christmas was probably the only one who recognized it was going to last an awful lot longer and cost a lot more in blood and treasure. So when young men were exposed to trench warfare, when they finally met the German in or as a POW, and then he looked at the German and thought, well, God, he's just a bit like me, isn't he? Ordinary, just ordinary blokes, most of them, had no greater desire to be there than the British did. And when it became obvious as it was certainly through 1915, that the British high command did not know how to break the deadlock in the trenches, uh, but that every effort they made was hugely costly in terms of lives and actually did not progress the course of the war at all, attack after attack uh, through the stalemate of 1915. And then the horror of the Somme, the first day of the Somme, which we cannot, even today, we cannot begin to understand just how awful trench warfare actually was. Terrible beyond anything we can possibly comprehend or indeed want to comprehend. And that very quickly began to turn men, men like Charles Moss, uh, who had volunteered, of course, uh, turned them into cynics. And he wasn't the only one. And the looks at the war poetry. You see how the ide ideal version, the um, Rupert Brooke type romantic verse, gives way to a kind of weary, a weary acceptance like McRae's uh, in Father's Fields. And then from 1916 onwards, with people like Robert Graves, Secret Sassoon, and Wilfred Owen, you get a real cynicism creeping in, a realization uh, that uh, this war is not what it was um, built to be. It is, in fact, an awful tragedy uh, on, a, on a biblical scale. Thank you, John. Um, we have a comment from Gemma. We hear so much about World War II that I feel like World War I is almost forgotten sometimes. That was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Um, yeah, and there is, and I, you know, again, at a plug for all our local archives, case and archives, there's a tremendous amount of material in the archive. This is local material from you know, local men and women, which is, um, which is really the core of our understanding of the war. We can read about ground strategy and this plan and that plan and all the rest, but the reality of war, like, it's all done by ordinary people, not just at the front, but in the, the front line, in the rear, in industry. And indeed, in the home, the house life managing with rationing, it is a very human story. And it's one which affects you know, most of us, I think, if we were able to do our family history, going back mm. to our grandparents, great grandparents, great great grandparents, depending on age, we'll have people who were either served in or were affected one way or another by the Great War. Mm. It was a universal experience. Um, and so, in mm. terms of long term effects, then, um, would you like to say anything more about the sort of economic, social, cultural long term effects of the war, particularly in the Tyneside region? As I mentioned briefly before, Tyneside suffered, uh, the North suffered more grievously than the South. In, in the South, in the 20s and 30s, there were new industries, garden towns, a whole um, range of suburban sprawl was coming in, and there were new industries like car manufacture. The North, of course, was heavily dependent on traditional industries, coal mining, shipbuilding, heavy engineering, all of which went into quite significant decline in the interwar years. A result of which was that uh, many men lost their jobs or were on short time. There was, of course, industrial unrest. There was the Great Strike in 1926, which um, didn't really achieve any purpose. And uh, the conditions, particularly after 1929, when the International Great Depression bit home, conditions in the Northeast for people were extremely difficult. And what we have to remember is that there would be, throughout the 20s and 30s, on every street corner, limbless veterans begging. These are the heroes who'd come back from the front. And all that was left to them was to beg or to barter their medals uh, for scraps of food. It was an awful, dreadful, almost Dickensian picture here. And that was a consequence of the war. And that certainly lingered. And when war was declared again in 1939, there was no great rush. There was no enthusiasm. And of course, conscription in 1939 was introduced straight away. So the young men of right. 1939 did not have any choice but to go. But they went with a much heavier heart and a much greater resignation. And resentment, it has to be said, a building resentment uh, that their fathers had, had not experienced. 
Wow. I mean, it is stunning, isn't it? Really, when you when you think about it, and uh, uh, like you've said, it's it's so important never to forget. Absolutely, we we must never forget. Um, there's all the arguments at the moment about cancelling history and culture wars and all this sort of thing, but the reality is, um, history isn't nice. Most of history is not nice. There's an awful lot of terrible things happen to history, and to me, the whole ethos of history and studying history is not to forget or to rewrite what happened, but to learn from it, mm. to understand the mistakes that were made in the past. And that through that understanding, we may hope not to repeat the same mistakes in the future. It doesn't always happen, but that we can certainly, uh, it is the job of us, you know, those who uh, lecture and teach history, et cetera, write about it, to try and um, offer understanding as to what happened in the past, good and bad. Uh, and there's an awful lot of bad, but you can't write that out. You can't airbrush it out of history. It happened. History happened. Therefore, uh, history has to be respected because that's what it is. And our duty, our obligation is to try and extrapolate what lessons we can, what understanding we can that might enable us to improve matters and not to make the same mistakes in the future. And I guess, you know, when you're when you're talking about it, it makes me think of the um, the experience of the First World War being in such recent history for those people going into the Second World War, then they weren't enthusiastic because they really knew history was recent, wasn't it? Very recent. It was their parents' war. And um, again, interesting enough, this region, an awful lot of young men, uh, quite a few of my father's friends, uh, he was just too, volunteered in the International Brigade to serve in the Spanish Civil War, 1936-1939. There was a, a growing political awareness in the region. And of course, the International Brigades went to fight for the Republican government, which was broadly left, against the Nationalists, who were broadly right, led by Franco, of course, eventually uh, was successful. And really from 1933 onwards, there was a recognition that the far right, obviously the, the powers of fascism in Germany and in Italy, uh, and of course the uh, equally the rise of communism in Russia, opposed the major threat. And the, young, the generation who went to war in 1939, from everything I've read and the many veterans I spoke to, were better informed than their fathers had been and more questioning. And of course it was a result of that questioning uh, that um, at the end of the war, Churchill thought he would have a, a walkover with the election of 1945, mm. got it wrong. And of mm. course, it was an athlete with a reforming, a socialist agenda who was swept into power. Uh, and that, uh, that was uh, that victory, athlete's victory in 1945, I, I think you could say, in part, was a consequence of the First World War. Wow. We've got another comment from Gemma who um, says absolutely is so important that we learn what really happened. Um, and I mean, with that, Gemma, I think it's it's really thank you so much, John, for, for uh, going yeah. through some of those different sorts right. of experiences that people ha had. Um, I would like just to do a little plug for Gateshead Archive. We've got the um, if you if you go on gateshead.localstudies.com you can search there for photographs and all sorts of different um, um, exhibits there that we have but particularly the photographs we've got lots of photographs from Elizabethville um, with the Berkeley refugees and the Belgian refugees sorry um, and there are also a lot of photographs there of women doing um, war work in the first world war um, working in the shipyards and doing all sorts of different men's jobs um, and if you particularly search the photographs from 1918 you'll see lots of uh, lots of those photographs so Gemma if you'd like to have a, a bit more of a look at different things that were going on in Gateshead during the uh, First World War then do feel free to have a look at that website and have a search for some of those photographs. Um, well, it's been absolutely um, very interesting to, to hear everything that you've said, John, and thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Gemma, for your comments um, and to everyone else for listening. Um, and we've got next week, we've got Andrew Clark with uh, Beer, Brewers and Pubs. So that That's would be an interesting good, yeah. one. A uh, little <laughs> bit of a change of... of um... What's not to like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but thank you very much, everybody. And uh, just a few more weeks left of our series of talks here for Heritage Hour uh, before we go into the summer. And um, so, yeah, have a lovely evening, everybody. And take care. <laughs>
Same for me. Thanks so much. Good night, everyone. Good night.